Hi, brothers and sisters. This is Ryan Zell of Christian Virtue and Grace. In number 10 of the Protestant Scripture Twister series, we will look at 1 Peter 3, 21, which states, corresponding to that, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now let us look at the passage preceding 1 Peter 3.21, and we will see the context very clearly and the meaning of baptism now saves you. For it is better to suffer for doing right, if that should be God's will, than for doing wrong. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah during the building of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were saved through water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a clear conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In verse 20, eight persons were saved through water. What Peter is doing here is using typology to show that Noah and the seven others were saved through water. And in verse 21, he states, baptism now saves you. I will now show some of the Protestant arguments and how they will twist the scriptures to make it say, baptism does not save you. There are many objections to baptismal regeneration by the heterodox, and we only will touch upon a few of them. First, Baptism, now saving you, goes against the doctrine of justification by faith alone. If you are saved by faith alone, then baptism cannot save you, despite the Holy Spirit-inspired words of 1 Peter 3.21, revealing that baptism now saves you. The doctrine of sola fide, a.k.a. faith alone, is so precious that the heterodox will deny the revealed words of the Holy Spirit that baptism now saves you. Many of the heterodox, that includes Protestants and the unprotestant Protestants who claim they aren't Protestants like Baptists, they will claim that baptism is only symbolic or an ordinance and therefore does not save you. Again, this goes against faith alone. Baptism, therefore, does not save you. It is an outward ordinance, something to be seen by men. Once again, we hear that requiring anything other than faith alone is a works-based salvation. Therefore, baptism does not save you. They cannot allow 1 Peter 3 to 1 to say what it actually says. Baptism now saves you. We go on. This article comes from the Protestant website, God Questions. I will have the web URL in the description box. What I will now read to you is Protestant scripture twisting at its finest. Those who believe that baptism is required salvation are quick to use 1 Peter 3 one as a proof text because it states baptism now saves you. Was Peter really saying that the act of being baptized is what saves us? If he were, he would be contradicting many other passages of Scripture that clearly show people being saved as evidenced by their receiving the Holy Spirit prior to being baptized or without being baptized at all. A good example of someone who was saved before being baptized is Cornelius and his household. In Acts 10, we know that they were saved before being baptized because they had received the Holy Spirit, which is the evidence of salvation. 
The evidence of their salvation was the reason Peter allowed them to be baptized. Countless passages of Scripture clearly teach that salvation comes when one believes in the gospel, at which time he or she is sealed in Christ with the Holy Spirit of promise. The church recognizes that people can be saved without baptism, so that is a false assertion. But the ordinary way we are saved is through baptism. And this includes Cornelius and his entire household, who Peter asked for water for. This was an extraordinary way for the Gentiles to be brought into the church by having the Holy Spirit conferred upon them in front of the Jewish witnesses to this fact. And this is correct as well. But the fact remains that baptism now saves you. Whether you are baptized with water or through the extraordinary means such as the baptism of desire or blood, or God himself will baptize you directly with the Holy Spirit. We go on. Now let's look at the following paragraph. This paragraph tries very hard to use the rest of the sentence in 1 Peter to show that baptism does not save you by stating this phrase. Thankfully, though, we don't have to guess at what Peter means in this verse because he clarifies for us with the phrase, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience. What the author is trying to say here is he's trying to negate the words of baptism now saves you as meaningless. We have already read the context of verse 1 Peter 3.21 Who formerly did not obey when God's patience waited in the days of Noah during the building of the ark in which a few, that is, eight persons, were now saved through water. Just as Noah and his family were saved through water, so does baptism now save you. And it saves you because it isn't like taking a bath with the removal of dirt from your flesh your body. Jesus has sanctified the waters of baptism at the Jordan when he was baptized. That during that time that Jesus was out of the body, he went to preach the good news to the righteous and repentant souls in the bosom of Abraham from the time of Noah. And that the ark, which is a type of the church, which is typology, that through this sacrament of baptism, which now saves you, not as ordinary water saves, but by the waters of baptism, conferring on your heart and your soul, sanctifying grace and the virtues of faith, hope, and agape. We go on. This entire paragraph sums up just about every argument I've encountered by the heterodox on 1 Peter 3.21, and baptism now saves you. Thankfully, though, we don't have to guess at what Peter means in this verse because he clarifies that for us with the phrase, not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience. Brothers and sisters, this is Protestant scripture twisting at its finest. As stated and shown, Peter has directly given us the context. Protestants are changing the context. It's no longer Noah and his family being saved through water. They state, while Peter is connecting baptism with salvation, it is not the act of being baptized that he is referring to, not the removal of dirt from the flesh. Being immersed in water does nothing but wash away dirt. What Peter is referring to is what baptism represents, which is what saves us, an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let's stop right there for a moment. That is not correct. Not so, says Peter, just as the waters, as in baptism, and the ark, as in the church, baptism now saves you. They were saved through water, and we are saved by baptism. And we go on, and they state, in other words, Peter is simply connecting baptism with belief. It is not the getting wet part that saves, but the appeal to God for a clean conscience, which is signified by baptism, that saves us. This is Protestant scripture twisting, as we can clearly see. 
Jesus and Peter connect baptism with now saves you. In the last sentence of this paragraph, it states, the appeal to God always comes first. First belief and repentance, then we are baptized to publicly identify ourselves with Christ. And this is correct. God always acts first to move us by grace, and we respond to that grace. And through the hearing of the gospel, belief and repentance, we then make a public profession of faith and are baptized where the love of God is poured into our hearts and therefore into our souls by the Holy Spirit with fire. The appeal to God for a good conscience does not negate baptism now saves you as they want you and I to believe. What does an appeal to God for a good conscience actually mean? So here we have to ask, why does baptism give us a good conscience? Peter isn't just connecting baptism and belief here. In baptism, all our sins are forgiven, and we are raised to a new life in Christ. Ezekiel prophesied in 36, 25 to 38, and I will read it. I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you, and a new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will take out of your flesh the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances. You shall dwell in the land which I gave to your fathers, and you shall be my people, and I will be your God. This sounds like being a new creature in Christ. Does this sound symbolic to you? There are other prophecies, but I won't go into them. Let's discuss baptismal regeneration. The ancient Catholic Church has always taught that baptism now saves you. When Christ descended into the waters, he sanctified the waters of baptism. What did Jesus say to Nicodemus? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. The heterodox have gone so far as to claim that this water is not the waters of baptism. And what is it, I have asked? The water Jesus is speaking of is amniotic fluid. Oh, really? Amniotic fluid? I kid you not. Amniotic fluid is urine and the byproducts of metabolism. And what I tell them is, well, you were baptized of urine and the spirit of stupidity. I can't help myself. What do the apostles tell us about baptism? I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Mark 16, 16. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Doesn't sound too symbolic to me. And now, why do you wait? Rise and be baptized, and wash away your sins, calling on his name. 1 Corinthians 6.11 is one of my favorites. And such was some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. He has put his seal upon you and given us his Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. But now the Spirit has come. We are no longer under the custodian, for in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through him. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Once again, not one of these passages sounds to me like a symbolic baptism or as an ordinance. 
Ephesians 5.24, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present her to the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Colossians 2.11-12, In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body in the circumcision of Christ. And you were buried with him in baptism, in which you were raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. Acts 2, 338. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Titus 3, 5. He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. With all these passages of scripture just read, we can now say with confidence, baptism now saves you. Please consider subscribing to Christian Virtue and Grace, participate in the comments, and please give us a thumbs up. God bless you all.